In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to God on high. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to give your attention to the children of our grade school, kindergarten through second grade, as they sing an anthem. The words of the anthem are printed for you in an insert in the bulletin.
Today is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. The scripture readings focus our attention on the fact that God calls us to forgive as we have been forgiven by God. Our first lesson illustrates that so beautifully in the account of Joseph forgiving his brothers. This will also serve as our sermon text this morning. Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now, please, forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson is taken from Ephesians chapters 4 and 5 here. We have the encouragement from the Apostle Paul to also be forgiving as God, in fact, has forgiven us to be imitators of him. Do not let any unwholesome talk come from your mouths. Say only what is beneficial when there is a need to build up others so that it will be a blessing to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of every kind of bitterness, rage, anger, quarreling, and slander along with every kind of malice. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Therefore, be imitators of God as his dearly loved children, and walk in love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia. Everything that, is, that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 18, beginning with verse 21. Glory be to you, O Lord. This follows immediately after our gospel lesson from last Sunday, where we are, were encouraged to be accountable to our brother if they sin against us. Here in this text, it tells us that when they sin against us, we should be willing and eager to forgive and forgive again. This is the, the parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came up and asked Jesus, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother when he sins against me? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you as many as seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants when he began to settle them, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Because the man was not able to pay the debt, his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, children, and all that, that he owned to repay the debt. Then the servant fell down on his knees in front of him, saying, Master, be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. The master of that servant had pity on him, released him, and forgave him the debt. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began choking him, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and begged him, saying, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. 
Instead, he went off and threw the man into prison until he could pay back what he owed. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were very distressed. They went and reported to their master everything that had taken place. Then his master called him in and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt when you begged me to. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? His master was angry and handed him over to the jailers until he could pay back everything he owed. This is what my heavenly Father will also do to you, unless each one of you forgives his brother from his heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you. Christ. Let's confess our faith in our forgiving God with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. You have heard the word of God that we will consider this morning. Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. I would just point our attention to this phrase once again. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? The text. the name of our Lord Jesus, of whom the children reminded us, came in our stead, our salvation, and also who sends us forth, as you just sang, to bring the message of pardon and peace. Beloved. Well, I just can't. I, I won't do it. When you think of what he, she, or they did to me, I'm supposed to forgive? Who are we kidding? I mean, did you, do you recognize the pain, the loss, the suffering that came because of sh what she or he did? I'm just not able to forgive, and that's true. By nature, we don't forgive. By nature, the unregenerate, the unbelieving, are filled with thoughts of revenge, retaliation, resentment, and what other get you phrases we might use. It's sort of like the little child. Maybe some of you children have had this experience. Somebody gives you a push on the playground, you turn around and push them back, and even harder, perhaps. Forgive? I mean, I have a claim on it. What they did? You heard, however, in that great gospel reading this morning, we are to forgive our brothers from the heart. Do we? Bitterness is battling within us so often, and out there, of course, in the world. But you and I have all felt it. I want to get back at them. Oh, may a forgiving God teach us, as alone he can do, and take us to remember his beloved servant, Joseph. This is a great text. And I might say, if you have the opportunity today, take your Bibles Read Genesis chapters 37 through 50. It really struck me this morning, uh, about a third or fourth grader left the church after the first service, and he said, well, I just read all of Genesis. Anyway, look at the scriptures and remember that the forgiven child of God forgives. What's the basis of that? And then we know the blessing. Now there's no one here that can perhaps even begin to identify with Joseph in the Old Testament, the second youngest son of Jacob out of the 12. Of course, you know the favoritism. Sometimes people will say, if you have some children, who's your favorite? Watch out, parents. Joseph was Jacob's favorite, and the Bible says so. It says he loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. So he gave him, you remember, that coat of many colors. The Bible says when the brothers saw this, they were filled with jealousy, which Jacob also recognized. And the Bible says they hated Joseph. And they could not speak a kind word to him. And besides that, do you remember his dreams? Those 12 sheaves of grain, 11 of them bowing down to Joseph's sheave in his dream? Or then there was another dream. 
There are 11 stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to Joseph's star, representing the 11 brothers and the father and the mother. And the Bible says once again to us, those brothers hated him again all the more because of his dreams. He's 17 years old, this Joseph, at this point. You've got to know a little of this history, and it's good review for every one of us. Jacob sends him out to see how the brothers are doing. The ten brothers are tending the flock out there, and he sends Joseph out to see how they're doing. When they see him coming, they say, here comes the dreamer. And they plotted to kill him. You say, well, that's a whoa, that's a big step, is it? First John, it said, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. That's exactly what they plotted. And if Reuben, the oldest, hadn't stepped in and pleaded for the brother Joseph, he's of our blood, he said. So they threw him into a cistern, a big hole where the water was stored in those days. And then they sat around wondering what they're going to do. Reuben wasn't there at that moment. Judah also pleaded for him, not to, to the brothers, not to kill Joseph. But then, oh, an opportunity. Some Ishmaelites, a caravan was coming by, and they sold their brother for 20 pieces of silver. Can you imagine that? Do you have any brothers or sisters think, they're going to sell me? Would they even think of it? He's taken away out of sight, out of mind, they thought, into faraway Egypt. Then they kill one of their father's flock, soak his coat of many colors in the blood, and then they just take it back to Jacob and let him assume what he wants to assume. And what does the dear father assume? That a wild animal has torn a Joseph to bits, and Jacob grieves so that no one could comfort him, the Bible says. Now you've got Joseph in faraway Egypt. Again, he's 17. And for the next 13 years of his life, he has all tremendous ups and downs. He goes into the household of Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, treated wonderfully, and then the wife lies about him, falsely accused. Joseph's thrown into the, the dungeon, the prison. In the prison, he prospers. Now this goes on from 17 to the age of 30. Just remember that. And then he interprets the dreams of two of the Pharaoh's workers or servants, a cupbearer and the baker. The dreams come true. They forget about him. He's forgotten. Then Pharaoh has those troubling dreams. Do you remember? Seven, the number seven, seven fat cows, seven lean cows, the lean eat the seven fat, seven good ears, seven lean ears, the lean eating the fat. He doesn't know he's troubled. And then, oh, then the cupbearer finally remembers. Oh, I know this fellow in the prison. He interpreted our dreams. So they called Joseph out to the prison, bring him to Pharaoh, and Joseph said, this is what your dreams mean, because God is interpreting them for me. You're going to have here in Egypt seven bountiful years, and then you're going to have seven awful years of famine. So you better prepare for it. And then in the hand of a gracious God, Joseph becomes the administrator. In more than that, the Bible says he becomes second only to Pharaoh, the prime minister. It's striking. The scripture says no one could even lift a hand without Joseph's approval. And he goes throughout the land, gathering, gathering, gathering for that seven year of famine that certainly came. And it was a famine that spread through the known world at that time. Terrible famine. But Egypt prepared even enough to sell to other countries, if you read the scriptures. And then Jacob sends his, brother, uh, his sons up there to buy some food from the Egyptians so that they could survive. Now when they came up into the presence of Joseph, they didn't recognize Joseph. He looked like an Egyptian, he talked like an Egyptian, but you can be sure of this. Joseph knew them immediately. And he tested them in grace and mercy to see if they had changed. And they had. Oh, they had. 
So much so that he's reunited with them with tears and weeping. And then they go home and you read the account for yourself. Jacob the father and the rest of the family brought into Egypt. And there they are cared for, wonderfully cared for. Seventeen years later, Joseph's now perhaps in his mid-fifties, his dear father Jacob dies. And that's when our text takes up this account. Listen, beloved. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they send word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the, son, the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. Then it goes on, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Here they came recognizing their sin, confessing their sin. And Joseph said, don't be afraid. I'm, I'm not the judge. The sins are forgiven. What my father told you is correct. You're forgiven. And he weeps. Some believe that Joseph wept because of sorrow over the fact that the brothers didn't believe him after this time, these 17 years. But perhaps it's better said this way. There were tears of absolute joy over the repentance and change in the heart of his brothers. What moved Joseph to that? What's the basis of this child of God forgiving? Was it because he was simply a nice guy? Oh, it was his faith in the Lord God and the promise of the Christ to come in whom he had perfect forgiveness and he could only do one thing but to forgive. Scripture speaks about this in other places. We're told, for example, Ephesians 4, 32. You heard these words as Pastor read them from the Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Again, they read this way. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. There it is. Just as in Christ. Or, Again, Colossians 3. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. How could these boys think that? Don't be afraid. Earlier, when he first revealed himself to them, this is what this marvelous man Joseph said. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. God did this. That's what he said. Basis? You understand? I must understand, we all do, the enormity of our sins. That whatever, whenever we sin, whatever we do, it's a rebellion against the eternal God. And he is the only one that can declare forgiveness. Every foul word that ever came in, out of our mouth, every thought that was lustful and evil and covetousness, and wicked and adulterous, every action, every time you said to mama, I won't do it, every kind of sin against a spouse or a loved one or a neighbor or someone that committed against us, there were sins and our sins against the eternal God. 
we are in total debt to him. Like the king in the gospel reading. An enormous, unpayable debt. And what does he do? He sends his son. And he teaches us to pray. Forgive us our sins, debts, trespasses, as we forgive. That's what he does. He sent that son. Someone put it this way. In the angry ground at Calvary, he planted deeply the cross on which his only holy beloved son, our substitute, Jesus, died, suffered, paid, with not only the sins of the world, but the guilt of the world. Do we understand that? That's the basis. And it's everything, friend. It's everything we are. It's the very heart of the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, the means of grace. Be baptized and wash away your sins given and poured out for you at communion for the remission, the sending away of sins. Colossians 3.13. It says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not only are we forgiven, but we're declared righteous as if we have never sinned. We're clothed with Christ's holiness, reconciled to God by the death of his Son. You want forgiveness? You want a basis for what we do and how we live? Here it is. No other place to look. And what a place to look. And think about it. What does it mean, forgiven? The Greek has a couple of meanings. One word we sometimes translate as remission. Send it away. It's sent away. Another word means it's simply gone. Let go of it, or it's lifted away. And that's exactly what happened. Forgiven means that. In the scriptures, Old and New Testament, again and again and again, scripture after scripture, we're told it's blotted out, it's purged, we're cleansed, we're purified, we're delivered, we're freed, and on and on. We're atoned for. He's paid it all. There's no other payment left, no other payment to ever be made, and it's been made, and we're forgiven. God, give us that wonderful certainty, as he alone can through his gospel. So nothing remains now. The basis of it all you think of Joseph, you think of the brothers, you think of you and me. Well, you know what he did? To Listen to this. The writer to the Hebrews quotes Jeremiah the prophet. He said, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Joseph, what kind of a man was he? Luther comments on Joseph and he said, the most merciful mercy within and without. Forgiven. The for forgiven child of God forgives. And what are the blessings? What are they really? Listen to the text. A few verses remaining. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. But one other thing took place just before that. It says, His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said, giving up all their rights knowing the wickedness of their deeds toward that boy. We'll be your slaves. Twice, Joseph says, don't be afraid. And he reassured them, just as he 
reassures us. So the good thing was they confessed repentance, turning, changing. God be praised. You know, it's sort of like a spiritual selfie. Pull out the camera and take a picture. What's on that picture? Just you. With all of your blemishes, all of the faults, just you. So the law is that. It's absolutely accurate. And then if that festers, the claws of guilt begin to dig into our souls. But then comes the message, and that's the good. Don't be afraid. I have redeemed you. Think of that King David. You want to think of blessings in his life? Right after his sin of adultery, murder, deception, rebellion against God, Nathan comes and he tells him the story and Nathan says to him, you are the man, you are the one. And what does David say? I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan the preacher said, the Lord has put away, taken away your sin. Later on, King David, not much later on, wrote the great Psalm 51. He said, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He's talking to God. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. But then he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Blot, wash, cleanse. And of course the Lord did. And he does for all of us. Blessings. Brothers, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save many lives. And he did for four centuries after Joseph in Egypt. Prosper the Israelites as they lived in Goshen. Beyond words. Good. He, he preserved his covenant people, and Joseph knew that as well, from which would come that great deliverer, Jesus Christ, our Savior. For good. And then the kind, reassuring words of a forgiven child of God, he spoke kindly to them. So what's left here, friend? You and me, here we sit. Yes, I know we should be out beyond the doors with the publican, the tax collector. What did he say? Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. And yet we come into his house to hear the word again, forgiven. Sins taken away. Is that also being done in your home, in the classroom, in school, at work? What a sweet and wonderful word it is. It's sort of like that wonderful breeze on a late autumn day with such brilliance, isn't it? Mama says to a child who really got under her skin with something that the child did, I forgive you because Jesus forgives you and he's forgiven me. Or you say to a spouse or a family member who simply has done what you think is beyond, beyond the, the pale of decency. I forgive you. And what a joy it is to hear. Somebody says, Pastor, friend, brother, father, mother, please forgive me. Then we can say it. I forgive you. Most wonderful word, is it not, Pastor? To be able to say that to a congregation. He forgives you. It's a privilege we certainly don't deserve or could any way earn. God help us all to say it that way. To every, to anyone. And get rid of that, that bottled up resentment, that retaliation. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. So pray, Lord, through faith in Christ, I bask in the light of his forgiveness, and only then can I live it. So we live it. Forgiveness. The forgiven child of God forgives. 
And beloved, it's the only way to live. Amen. And the peace of God, and it is certainly peace, that passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Hold me with your free spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for reconciling us to yourself through the sufferings and death of your dear Son, through whom we have perfect healing, forgiveness, and life, and confidence to enter into your presence and to bring you our prayers and petitions. Out of the infinite bounty of your goodness, 
Grant us a rich measure of your spirit. Let the love of Christ fill your church so that it may flourish in all good works. Help us to show love and compassion and forgiveness for all. Bestow on us, our nations of the earth, the knowledge of your mercy, that they may turn to you, the only God, and find salvation in you. Strengthen our faith so that we unfailingly come to you in prayer for all our bodily needs. Give a special measure of your power to those who are sorrowful or grieving, to those who are in pain or sickness, to those who may be in temptation or peril, that they may receive your blessed help. O oh Lord, wait patiently for them, so that they may patiently endure any chastening and affliction you permit to come into our lives, knowing that you are using these things in love to prepare us for that joyful communion with you, which is ours for all eternity. We also, o Lord, come to you giving you thanks for the 40 years of Christian marriage you have so wonderfully given Chris and Jim Goodrow. As they celebrate this blessing today, may their hearts be filled with joy and may the love they have for you continue to fill their hearts and their home. We ask it in the name of our precious Savior who taught us also to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Now, Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to all of you. A special thanks to our God for the children of our grade school, kindergarten through second grade, uh, giving us such beautiful, precious gifts and such a wonderful message as they proclaimed it so clearly and in beautiful song. Thank you. Uh, just a note, I will be in Wisconsin today until Wednesday at a symposium for the Reformation uh, in, uh, at the seminary. So uh, if, if things come up, I can be reached by cell phone or, or Pastor Otto here as well. Also take note, because of the teachers' conference at the end of the week, take note of the, the office hours, the shortened office hours this week. Also uh, to re be reminded, uh, voters, there's a voters meeting next Sunday at 2 o'clock. We have on the docket elections as well as the budget to discuss and, and vote on among other things as well. Also, I have a letter from Pastor Joel Voss, whom we've called. Dear members of St. Paul, I have received the divine call to serve as your pastor. I am now faced with the responsibility of determining the needs and opportunities of the two calls I hold, assessing the gifts the Lord has given me to do his work, and then determining where I can best serve in his kingdom. I ask for your fervent prayers as I make those deliberations. You have my assurance that I will do so with prayer and meditation on the Word of God. I hope to arrive at a decision regarding your call in several weeks. When I do, I will inform you of that decision by telephone and letter. May God's will be done among us in his service, Pastor Joel Voss. So uh, he serves our, our synod, um, it, well, he serves a congregation in Centerville, Ohio, but he also serves our synod as the second vice president. And so... Uh, uh, keep him, his family, his congregation in your prayers at this time. Finally, as you leave today, you have the October edition of the Forward in Christ uh, that will be handed out by the deacons. May God richly bless your week. <laughs>